Objective First, Fourth Edition, by Annette Capel and Wendy Sharp, published by Cambridge University Press and Uckles, 2014. This recording is copyright. CD One. Track Two, Unit One, One Point One, Exercise Six, Example, Speaker One. I'm not a suit man. Even for work, I can get away with casual stuff. Though I still like my clothes to look smart. I love shopping. My favourite place is Paul Smith in Covent Garden. I bought a really nice woolen shirt there recently. Clothes are important to me, but they need to be comfortable as well as stylish. Track three, one point one, exercise six, speaker two. I started working this year, so I'm able to get new clothes more regularly than before. When I had to save up for months, I buy a lot online. My mum thinks I should cut down the amount I spend on clothes, but my image is really important to me. If someone sees me in something once, I don't like to go out in it again. Well, not for a while, in any case. I like to wear bright colours, and my makeup's a bit outrageous. I always dress up when I go clubbing. I buy a big range of styles, and I try to keep up with the latest fashions. Speaker three. Shopping for clothes isn't really my scene, if you know what I mean. I don't really mind what I wear, to tell you the truth. I'm the least fashion-conscious person I know. I suppose, if anything, I favour the casual look. I've got two pairs of jeans, and I wear them mostly with a sweatshirt or something. I have got one favourite T-shirt which a girlfriend gave me. It's red and it's got a sort of abstract design printed in navy blue on the back. She said she gave it to me so I'd always stand out in a crowd. Speaker four. My clothes have to be comfortable, make me feel relaxed as soon as I slip them on. I often put together outfits from stuff I find in street markets. They're less expensive that way. Second-hand clothes can be real bargains, and usually they've hardly been worn. I'll change the look of my clothes quite frequently, you know, sew in a new piece of material, swap buttons, dye something a different colour, just for a change. I make a lot of my own jewellery, though having long hair, I don't wear earrings very often. Speaker five. My friends take far less trouble with clothes than I do. Sometimes they wear the tattiest things ever. As my job involves dealing with people, I have to make an effort to look good all the time. I like to present a classy, sophisticated image. I go shopping for clothes about once a month. Though if I see something by chance, I'm quite likely to go for it there and then. I think I've got good taste, and I very rarely make a mistake when I buy clothes. I did take a jacket back last week, but that was because it was badly made. Track four, unit three, three point one, exercise two. Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Jackson, and I'm here today to tell you about my recent trip to the Antarctic. Now, the first question people generally ask me is, "Did I freeze?" And my answer is that, amazingly, no, I didn't. The temperature can go as low as minus ten degrees even during the summer months. But while I was there, it was about plus seven, and I found it quite comfortable. However, you should take warm clothes with you, and you really need a windproof coat. But what I found most useful were some sunglasses. The sun can get really strong with the reflection off the snow and ice. On the ship, I had my own cabin, and pretty small it was too. At first, I wondered where I was going to put my things, as there was no wardrobe. However. Whoever designed the ship thought of just about everything a passenger would need, and under the bed there was a cupboard. The atmosphere on board the ship was great. The crew were mainly American, and they really did their best to get everyone to mix. But of course, you don't have to socialise if you don't want to. The expedition leader was Australian, and he sat at a different table for dinner every night so he'd get to meet us all. He was really friendly and informative. As to the weather, well, it can get stormy in the Antarctic, but the ocean was calm while I was there. 
That was good because I was worried about getting seasick before I went. Luckily, I was okay, and few of the other passengers had problems. Do I have any special memories? Well, it's hard to say, really. There are so many. We saw a few whales, especially near a place called Couverville Island. But I guess what I most treasure is the large variety of birds we saw. They were terrific. Of course, the Antarctic doesn't have many people living there, and the only people we saw, apart from tourists, were a few of the scientists at a research station. They gave us coffee and biscuits one morning. There's a landing strip there, but no harbour or anything like that. You have to get onto shore in a small rubber motorboat. In the past, there used to be a thriving fishing industry in the area, but all that's left are some deserted buildings now. No old boats or machinery or anything like that, though. I'm often asked if I felt guilty about disturbing such an untouched region as Antarctica. I guess yes and no. Cruise ships aren't allowed to dump rubbish or to go where they like, and they have to take scientists to lead the excursions. There are rules, of course. Only small parties are permitted to land in one area at a time, and you've got to keep quiet and not bother the wildlife. So, all in all, I felt that well-run trips like this one would do more good than harm. I also felt completely changed by the experience. It was like going to another world. Now, if any of you have any questions, track five, unit five. 5.1. Exercise 5. 1. I'd had this interview for a job up on the 27th floor of a big office block. It was after six, and a lot of people had already left. I got in the lift and pressed the button. At first, I noticed that it sort of shook, but it started to go down. Then there was this horrible sound of twisting metal, and it shuddered to a stop. I was stuck between the twelfth and thirteenth floors. To begin with, I was determined not to panic. There was an emergency button which I pushed for ages. Next, I saw a phone, but when I lifted the receiver, it was dead. At this point, I completely went to pieces. I shouted and screamed. I hammered on the doors, but nobody helped. Eventually, I sank to the floor. And wept like a child. In the end, it was a good four hours before the night porter realised what had happened and called the fire brigade. I've never been in one since. Track six, five point one, exercise seven, two. Somehow I have to sort out their problem. This fear they have of flying. First, we talk as a group. And one by one, they tell me about particular times when they've flown and what happened. Nine times out of ten, they describe regular, problem-free flights, just like the hundreds I flew myself. You see, most of their worries are only in their imagination. I also use drama and role play to teach them how to deal with other people's fears, because through that they sometimes forget their own problem or take it less seriously than before. Finally, but only if I think it's still necessary, we go up in a plane. My passenger is accompanied by an actor who plays the part of the nervous first-time traveler. I sit a few rows behind, and it's wonderful to watch my student staying calm, offering advice to this stranger. I've never failed yet. Three. Mum, it's me. Look, I know you must be really angry, and I'm very sorry. We didn't mean to get lost out on the hills, but oh, Tom, it's so good to hear your voice. We've been worried stiff since the police called round. We were sure this phone call would be bad news. I mean, it's been three days. Are you really okay? Yeah. Helen's got a few bruises from her fall, and we haven't eaten much in three days, obviously. But other than that, yeah, we're doing fine. Well, that's something. Your dad is still absolutely furious with you, of course. When do you think you'll be able to get home? The day after tomorrow, all being well. We hope to get the. Four. 
It was late at night, and I was in the living room watching television on my own. Funnily enough, I was watching a horror movie. It wasn't very scary, though. Well, I thought I heard a noise upstairs, so I turned off the TV, held my breath, and listened. And then there was this horrific crash. My first thought was, "It's a burglar." I was scared stiff, but I knew I had to go up there. I remember I picked up an umbrella. Goodness knows what I would have done with it. Anyway, I crept up the stairs, and the first thing I saw was a bookcase on its side with hundreds of books on the floor. Then I heard this whimpering sound coming from underneath the pile of books. It was the next door neighbor's cat I'd heard. While I was putting away the books, I found something else—a live frog. That's when I was absolutely petrified. It sort of jumped out at me. Five. Hi, Julie. If your phone switched off, I guess you must be celebrating. Wow. This must feel as good as the day you graduated from university. No, even better than that. Anyway, just to say, you made me a very proud dad. I'm absolutely delighted for you. You've worked so hard to achieve your goal, and you thoroughly deserve what they've offered you. I can't wait to see your novel in the shops. When will it be coming out? Do you know? It's funny, isn't it? All those writing competitions you went in for as a child, and you never won a thing. But you never gave up, did you? Well, as I said, I am really, really proud of you. Speak soon. Love you. Six. We were all living in a small house in the countryside at the time. The house was in the middle of nowhere, and it was quite a long journey back from the university each evening. So I'd bought myself a small motorbike. Anyway, on one particular evening, I was on my way home when a really thick fog came down. I didn't know where I was, and I became very uneasy. I went on rather slowly, but couldn't see anything I recognised. At one point, the road curved round, but because of the fog, I didn't see this and carried straight on, and hit a wall. The impact threw me off the bike, and I ended up underneath it with my leg trapped. I screamed for help, but of course there was no one about. I realised that I had to get up and carry on, or stay there all night. So I pulled myself out from under the bike. Got back on and somehow arrived home, where my friends all took one look at me and called an ambulance. I needed seven stitches, and they kept me in for observation. Seven. Malcolm Jarvis, you have recently sailed single-handedly around the world. At one stage, you were shipwrecked all alone in the middle of the ocean, clinging on to your damaged yacht. Weren't you terrified? Not at the time. I suppose I was too busy trying to survive. You mean finding things to eat? More basic than hunger. First, I had to get myself out of the sea. Sharks had been a problem there. I managed to pull myself back into the yacht, but it had taken in a lot of water, so I spent a bit of time sorting that out. And then, were you able to keep yourself warm? Only for a while. I wrapped myself in whatever I could find, including the sails. But by the second day, I was in a really bad way because I couldn't feel my fingers and toes. They were completely numb. That was the most dreadful time. It was just as well they found me when they did. Eight. We were all in the main room planning what to do that day. The others were looking at a map on the table, but I was standing by the back window. About six of them burst in, waving guns and shouting things in a dialect we didn't understand. I knew they hadn't seen me over by the open window. They grabbed John and Gary. Ruth rushed to the doorway, but they got her too. In the meantime, I had managed to throw myself safely outside and had crawled underneath the house. Because of the rainy season, all the houses there are raised above the ground on wooden stilts. I kept totally still. I remember watching a beetle on a leaf. Staring at it and hoping that they wouldn't find me. Finally, when I realised that they'd gone, I ran inside and radioed for help. My friends weren't so lucky; they were held as hostages for over three months. 
Track 7, Unit 6, 6.2, Exercise 1. 1. I'd buy a Seychelles Blue Bentley convertible. I'd buy a nice fat house in Holland Park. I'd get a lovely big house in the countryside. I'd buy a beautiful house in Spain with swimming pool, palm trees, that sort of thing. I'd get a flat in Manhattan, probably. Um, I'd also have a permanent chef, top of the range chef, who could cook all different types of food, so I could have whatever food I wanted, whenever I wanted it. I'd have my own personal masseur. Two. I think I would just alter my life entirely. I love the sun, and a Caribbean holiday stands out in my memory. Surrounded by clear turquoise sea, so I think I'd buy a yacht. And as I don't know anything about、um, sailing, I'd have to buy a crew as well. So、um, I, I'd get I'd get this luxurious yacht and a, a very skilled crew, and probably a skilled cook who would just take me all around the world, going from hot spot to hot spot, so I could have a really great time. Three. Well, I know I'd have a problem with having all that money. I, I think it is a problem, really, in some ways, because、uh, you you have a sort of social responsibility, and there are all kinds of people who you need to help, which I would want to do very much.、Um, so, of course, I'd sort out my debts, my families. But in the end, I think what I'd do is buy, depending on how much money I had, buy a huge house, really massive house, somewhere in the country, and just surround myself by all the people I want to be with,、um, and people who perhaps never had a chance to. Get out into the country at all. Four. Again, depending on how many millions I won,、um, it would change what I would or wouldn't do with it. Frankly, if it was a lot, I mean five million upwards, sort out my own debts, which God knows are bad enough. Sort out the family's debts and then invest as much as possible and just try and live off the interest. Keep it there, nice little nest egg, growing and growing and growing, developing. Flowering bountifully, and holiday, get away, move, anywhere but cold Britain. Track eight, unit seven, seven point two, exercise two. Speaker one. All of us in the office where I work love doing it, probably because we're all desperate to get out of that nine to five routine. It's an expensive sport, but we all joined a dangerous sports club to help keep costs down. The first time I did it, I really was frightened, as the ground seemed so far away. But I said to myself that nothing would happen, and I wasn't going to die. I did my first two jumps in Canada and London. Apparently, in Germany, they're doing it without being attached to a rope, but with just a net beneath. That could be pretty scary, couldn't it? Track nine, seven point two, exercise three. Speaker one. All of us in the office where I work love doing it, probably because we're all desperate to get out of that nine to five routine. It's an expensive sport, but we all joined a dangerous sports club to help keep costs down. The first time I did it, I really was frightened, as the ground seemed so far away. But I said to myself that nothing would happen, and I wasn't going to die. I did my first two jumps in Canada and London. Apparently, in Germany, they're doing it without being attached to a rope, but with just a net beneath. That could be pretty scary, couldn't it? Speaker two. About four years ago, I was very ill and nearly died. Some time later, I was involved in a serious car crash. It made me realise how risky everyday life is, and it seemed to cure me of fear. So I said to myself, "Why not push things to the limit?" So I had a go at whitewater rafting in the States, and then moved on to other things. It's been brilliant. I've done all sorts of things, from abseiling down mountains to skydiving. Now I try to keep giving myself difficult and exciting things to do. Not that I've got anything to prove; it's just a personal thing, really. I'm thinking of doing river sledging next. 
Speaker 3. I took part in a trek to ski across the Arctic last year. It was probably the most dangerous thing I've ever done, but I'd do it again tomorrow. I was conscious all the time that death was very near, and in a strange way that made it seem more fun. I cried in absolute terror sometimes, especially when the ice began to melt and great holes would suddenly appear just in front of me. It was the ultimate challenge for a skier like myself, and I guess I'm not afraid of anything anymore. In fact, I'm looking forward to skiing in the Antarctic next year. Speaker 4 I've always enjoyed diving, as it's quite an exciting sport. But last winter, I had the ultimate experience of going shark feeding in the Caribbean. The sharks were about three meters in length, and obviously they are quite aggressive and can bite you. But if you put on the right protective clothing and take precautions, it's no more of a risk than driving fast motor cars. I must say, I had more accidents when I went horse riding. I did feel a bit nervous as I went over the side of the boat. After all, I've seen stories about shark attacks on TV like everyone else. But I was never in any real danger. Speaker 5 Some of my mates had started doing this free climbing. You know, where you don't use ropes, only your hands and feet. I guess they needed to have a bit of excitement in their lives, didn't they? Me, I think I get enough from my job as a motorbike courier in London. Anyway, I went with them one weekend. It was terrifying, and I was sure I'd end up lying in a hospital bed, but I felt I had to do it, especially with them looking on. There was no pressure from them, but you know how it is. Anyway, I did my best, and I have to say it gave me a real buzz. I can understand why people go in for this type of thing now. Track 10, Unit 9, 9.2, Exercise 2, Part 1. There's one car advert that opens with part of a song by Bjork. It must have cost a fortune to make, and it looks tremendous. I've seen that one. You're not sure what it's advertising to begin with, are you? A graceful silver vehicle moving through an unusual landscape it could be a spacecraft of the future. All very stylish. The trouble is that it's a bit of a letdown when you realise it's just another car advert. Yes, the beginning is a bit misleading. It's funny, isn't it? Sometimes the most effective ads are the really simple ones. Mm. You know, like a football manager sitting down at the breakfast table with his family, enjoying a particular cereal. He eats it, so it must be good. And that actress from Friends advertising shampoo, Jennifer Aniston, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, seeing famous people on screen can be a huge influence on us. We see them as well as role models. Definitely. The ads they put on TV before the World Cup or the Olympics always use mega stars, don't they? Yeah. Remember the one that had a whole team of top footballers from around the world? The special effects were incredible. The budget must have been huge, all for one advert. But the company probably earned millions of dollars in increased sales. So for them, it was worth it. Track 11, 9.2. Exercise 3, Part 2 There's one advert I really like, partly because it's brilliantly put together. And it's for? Bacardi. It's set on a tropical island somewhere in the Caribbean, and there's this radio DJ who's broadcasting in a studio. Oh, and... no. Not Ray on Reef Radio. You've seen it too. Yep. Detested, actually. All about some friend of Ray's who's leaving for the mainland and how he's going to miss his wonderful life on the island. And you see what he's been up to. I adore the way the DJ, Ray, tells the storyline on air and you see flashbacks of the other guy, like, I know you're going to miss the way they serve Bacardi around here. And you see a girl throw a glassful in the friend's face. Such a striking image and totally unexpected. Mm. I suppose ads do work well when they contain something out of the ordinary. I guess they stick in your mind that way. Right. And, of course, the ending itself is unforgettable and quite spectacular, isn't it? Seeing the friend sailing away on the boat, listening to all this on his radio, and then what does he do? He dives off the deck and swims back to the island. For another night on the town and a glass of... Yes, yes. You know, I must admit that although I personally loathe the ad, it sells the product pretty well. It's got the right ingredients... You know, exotic location, powerful images. So what didn't you like about it? 
The characters themselves, I think, especially Ray. Oh, but come on! The very fact that you remember him now means he made an impact on you, which must mean that the ad has worked. True enough. <laughs> And what about you? You said it makes you laugh. Is is that why you like it so much?、Mm, that. And the way it succeeds in telling a story in such a short time, I think that's quite clever. Getting the message across like that, the music's great too. But was it truly successful? I mean, did you dig into your pocket and buy a bottle? <laughs> well, no, I don't drink spirits. I bet plenty of people were persuaded to rush out and buy some, though. Track twelve, nine point two, exercise five. In the studio with me today is Don Cooper, who has been very successful in producing commercials for television. Don, what is the most important thing to get right in this type of advertising? Well, I've made at least thirty commercials for television over the last few years, so I reckon I know pretty much what the magic ingredients are. I used to think that the setting was all important, but I've come to realise that you can have the most exotic location in the world and a truly fantastic storyline, but your commercial will not succeed if you ignore the people factor. It takes time and effort to select the perfect individuals to play your characters. But by getting this right, you'll draw your target audience in, make them relate to what's on the screen, and hopefully persuade them that they want a piece of what they're seeing. It's as simple as that.、Mm, I see. And what advice would you give to anyone writing a script? What's crucial there? The average TV commercial runs for just thirty seconds, so you haven't got long to get your message across. Don't opt for long, flowery sentences. Keep it short and punchy. Not only that, but remember that some people might not actually be watching the screen while the commercial is on. My golden rule is to mention the product itself in the audio, so that anyone who has wandered off to make coffee or check the kids' homework will still pick up on it. Right. Now your work is very creative, but is it difficult to keep coming up with new ways of promoting the same product? <laughs> That can become a challenge. Yes, if a company likes what you're doing, as likely as not, you'll be asked to make more than one commercial for a product over time. So it seems to me that consistency is an important issue. If you use the same voiceover or a jingle that echoes the last one in some way, you start to strengthen the company's image. And if the viewer begins to recognise the brand through links like these, you're halfway there already. The drawback with all of this is that you may have to walk away from new business in order to concentrate on a small number of favourite clients. And when you're ready to broadcast a commercial, how do you decide on where to show it and when? Selecting the most appropriate time and place for your finished commercial is absolutely crucial. Having it go out at three in the morning will save you money, but in actual fact, there's little point in doing this if your core audience, however large or small, is fast asleep. The same holds true for where you choose to broadcast your ad. A bad match between product and station can only spell disaster, so avoid it at all costs. Well, many thanks, Don. We'll be back to you with listeners' questions a bit later in the program. In the meantime. Track thirteen, exam folder five, paper three, part two, exercise two. One. To support the suggestion that one product is better than its competitors, the existence of actual proof is often mentioned. In one case involving the promotion of washing powder. Reference was made to an unnamed university research project, which analysed shades of white. Two. It must be true that there are more advertisements focusing on our love of driving than on anything else. While the messages of freedom and mobility are always important, it is above all the aspect of lifestyle that is stressed in this particular one. We are supposed to believe that this car will take us to new places in society and change our role forever. Three. 
Advertisers adopt different strategies as far as young people between the ages of 15 and 19 are concerned. For this population, it is not about conforming, but about the complete opposite of that. Indeed, products for this age group are frequently connected with unusual behaviour, the kind that older people, such as parents, might well disapprove of. 4. Turning to mothers and fathers as consumers, advertisements targeting these people often reinforce the experience of bringing up a family. An advert that links its product to young children, or even, interestingly enough, to puppies and kittens, will probably succeed because these images appeal directly to motherly, or perhaps less commonly, fatherly instincts. Track 14, Exam Folder 5, Paper 3, Part 2, Exercise 5. You will hear part of a talk about advertising jingles. For questions 1 to 10, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at Part 2. Today, I'm going to consider the history of the commercial jingle. So, first of all, what is it? Well, it's a type of slogan that is set to music. It could be very simple. For example, just a company name, if that's the most important message to get across. Jingles have been in existence since the birth of commercial radio in the USA in the 1920s. It is generally believed that the modern commercial jingle took off on Christmas Eve 1926 when a group of four singers was heard performing a jingle for a breakfast cereal. The product in question had not been selling well, but sales increased noticeably after the broadcast. In the early 1930s, listening to the radio was very popular in the States. There was no television then, of course. The rules on advertising did not permit the direct promotion of products during peak listening hours. The jingle was a clever way round this problem, and so advertisers started using them a lot. For example, one long running radio series called The Adventures of the Jenkins Family began with a short rhyming jingle for a dessert. Interestingly, this product was the first of its type to be marketed in the United States. And the catchy rhyme made a big impact on the public. In the 1950s, jingles became more sophisticated and famous songwriters were often signed up to write them. But by the 1980s, the public had grown tired of listening to jingles like these. Advertisers had to look for something else and they turned to pop songs. In 1987, the Beatles' tune Revolution was chosen for a Nike shoe campaign, and this marked a revolution in advertising too. Showing a good product was simply not enough any longer. To be successful, a commercial now had to represent a whole lifestyle, which is essentially where we are today. Drawing on the shared cultural experience of music has become the most effective way to sell a product, and with the record industry losing money because of downloading, advertising companies have been very welcome business partners. Psychologists who study the effects of music on the brain have found that music with a strong emotional connection to the listener is more memorable. And this has become an important area of research at one American university. Apparently, some songs contain a feature called an earworm. 
The term comes from a German word. An earworm is a tiny piece of music of between fifteen and thirty seconds that gets stuck in your head and tends to repeat itself. Popular examples include Queen's anthem "We Will Rock You" and the Mission Impossible theme tune. <laughs> the, the world of advertising is excited by the possibilities here, so we can expect our heads to be full of earworms before too long. Now you will hear part two again. Today I'm going to consider the history of the commercial jingle. So, first of all, what is it? Well, it's a type of slogan that is set to music. It could be very simple. For example, just a company name, if that's the most important message to get across. Jingles have been in existence since the birth of commercial radio in the USA in the 1920s. It is generally believed that the modern commercial jingle took off on Christmas Eve, 1926, when a group of four singers was heard performing a jingle for a breakfast cereal. The product in question had not been selling well, but sales increased noticeably after the broadcast. In the early 1930s, listening to the radio was very popular in the states. There was no television then, of course. The rules on advertising did not permit the direct promotion of products during peak listening hours. The jingle was a clever way round this problem, and so advertisers started using them a lot. For example, one long-running radio series called "The Adventures of the Jenkins Family" began with a short rhyming jingle for a dessert. Interestingly, this product was the first of its type to be marketed in the United States. And the catchy rhyme made a big impact on the public. In the 1950s, jingles became more sophisticated, and famous songwriters were often signed up to write them. But by the 1980s, the public had grown tired of listening to jingles like these. Advertisers had to look for something else, and they turned to pop songs. In 1987, the Beatles' tune "Revolution" was chosen for a Nike shoe campaign, and this marked a revolution in advertising too. Showing a good product was simply not enough any longer. To be successful, a commercial now had to represent a whole lifestyle, which is essentially where we are today. Drawing on the shared cultural experience of music has become the most effective way to sell a product, and with the record industry losing money because of downloading, advertising companies have been very welcome business partners. Psychologists who study the effects of music on the brain have found that music with a strong emotional connection to the listener is more memorable. And this has become an important area of research at one American university. Apparently, some songs contain a feature called an earworm. The term comes from a German word. An earworm is a tiny piece of music of between fifteen and thirty seconds that gets stuck in your head and tends to repeat itself. Popular examples include Queen's anthem "We Will Rock You." And the Mission Impossible theme tune. <laughs> the, the world of advertising is excited by the possibilities here, so we can expect our heads to be full of earworms before too long. Track fifteen, Unit ten, ten point two, Exercise seven. Speaker one. I find it quite scary, actually. Films like Blade Runner could really come true. Imagine a city like Los Angeles in twenty years' time. I mean, it's dangerous now, isn't it? Remember the riots? People will be living in rundown buildings, too frightened to come out. Oil supplies will have run out, so there won't be any cars. And with global warming and El Nino, the climate is changing. So the lack of sunlight and pouring rain in the film may well be accurate. What LA weather will be like? Speaker two. I'm reading one of his sci-fi ones at the moment. It all happens way off in the future, thousands of years from now. There are human-like characters, but they're a very sophisticated race. We'll never be as clever as them. They live for at least three hundred years, and after that, they can choose to live on in a different state. 
and there's no poverty, no war. For the human race, this seems impossible. There will always be some country at war with another. I don't see a long-term future for the human race. Even if our planet survives in one piece, we'll have wiped each other out or something. Speaker three. Things may be different, but they won't necessarily be any worse. We'll just enter a new phase of our culture, our existence. We've always adapted. I mean, think of the huge changes with the industrial revolution. Why should this be any different? And as for the eco threat, we're going to have to deal with it somehow, aren't we? I think we will. I can't accept that the human race will cease to be. Call me an optimist, but that's what I feel. Track sixteen, Unit Eleven, Eleven Point One, Exercise Three. So, Hannah, what was it like growing up in Hollywood as an only child and having such a famous mother? Well, I guess I was pretty privileged, as I had things most other kids only dream about. For instance, when I was fourteen, I just loved Harrison Ford films, and my mother arranged for me and a few friends to go to the film set to see him working on his latest film as a treat for my birthday. I don't think I was particularly spoilt, though, even though I was an only child, and I didn't get into trouble like some of the kids I knew did.、Uh, you yourself are an actress now. Did she ever try to put you off acting? <laughs> Not at all. Just the opposite. She felt I should follow my feelings. I guess in the same way she had done when she was younger. My grandparents hadn't wanted her to take up acting, you know, especially as she had to move from Europe to Hollywood. I don't think her family took her seriously at first, and I think she was quite homesick and felt she could have done with a little more family support. Now you look very like your mother, don't you? Oh yes, my mouth, the shape of my face, my jawline is my mother's. My nose too, but only the tip of it, not the bridge. That is unique, like no one else's in the family. My eyes, my forehead, my coloring, my height are different from my mother's, but everyone tells me I look like her. When I say everybody, I mean everybody. People stop me in shops, on the subway, in the street. What does your mother say about this? Well, we both looked in the mirror one day and came to the same conclusion: people exaggerate. Then one day I went into a dress shop. I was alone except for another customer. I thought to myself,、oh, "She looks like my mother." Then I walked too close to her and crashed into a mirror. <laughs> the lady was me. I hadn't recognized myself. <laughs> What qualities do you think your mother possesses? Oh, great physical energy. She used to walk fast, and when she wasn't acting, she cleaned and organized the house perfectly. <laughs> She loved acting more than cleaning. She loved acting most and above all. It took me some time not to feel hurt by this. I wanted to come first. When asked what was the most important thing in her life, she got real embarrassed and nervous. But my mother couldn't lie. She had to say acting, though I know for our sake she wished she could say family. She is terribly practical, and I am too. We consider it one of the greatest qualities in people. We give it the same status as intelligence. Practicality is what made my mother advise me to learn to be an accountant. If you know how to do it, you know you'll never be cheated out of any money. She says. <laughs> I didn't finish the course as I decided I wanted to act. Did she have any personal experience of being cheated out of money? Well, my mother has always been a very generous person to people she likes. I think another actor who she fell out with started the rumor that she's a bit stingy. She does say that I'm a bit extravagant. Now you don't sound like your mother, do you? Oh no, she still has a bit of an accent, but her voice is definitely an actress's voice. The clearest speech, the most commanding delivery, and loud. The family used to tell her that she didn't need a phone; she could have just talked to us on the other side of town, and we would have heard her. She justifies it with, "I picked it up in the theater. My voice has to reach all the way to the last row." Thank you for coming in today to talk to us, Hannah, and good luck in your new film, which I believe is released on Tuesday.、Uh, yes, that's right. Thank you. Track seventeen, exam folder six, paper three, part one, exercise two. 
You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer A, B, or C. Question one. You hear a woman calling a friend. Hi, Lizzie. I thought I'd just give you a ring to let you know about this afternoon. I'm actually getting an earlier flight now, as I need to get to Frankfurt for a meeting at four this afternoon, rather than for tomorrow morning as planned. Honestly, my boss is driving me mad. He changes plans at the drop of a hat. Anyway, I hope we're still okay to meet for coffee this morning. See you then. It won't take me long to get to the airport, as I'm already packed. Hi, Lizzie. I thought I'd just give you a ring to let you know about this afternoon. I'm actually getting an earlier flight now, as I need to get to Frankfurt for a meeting at four this afternoon, rather than for tomorrow morning as planned. Honestly, my boss is driving me mad. He changes plans at the drop of a hat. Anyway, I hope we're still okay to meet for coffee this morning. See you then. It won't take me long to get to the airport, as I'm already packed. Question two. You hear a man and a woman talking about a film they have just seen. Well, that was a long one, wasn't it? Was it? Seemed normal. No, no. That scene at the end should have been cut, if you ask me. I thought Jim Franklin was really good, though. Hmm. I've seen him do better, and that co-star was a weak character, wasn't she? What a shame! The book was absolutely gripping, and they haven't changed anything, so you can't criticise the story. Well, that was a long one, wasn't it? Was it? Seemed normal. No, no. That scene at the end should have been cut, if you ask me. I thought Jim Franklin was really good, though. Hmm. I've seen him do better, and that co-star was a weak character, wasn't she? What a shame! The book was absolutely gripping, and they haven't changed anything, so you can't criticise the story. Question three: You hear a woman describing a music festival. It's the fifth time I've been to the festival, and the program was the best ever, with some great headline acts. They put on some excellent workshops as well, which cost us nothing. I went to one on face painting and another on African dance. I was rather disappointed that they moved the event this year, though. We had much less room than before, and the camping spots were a joke. Apart from that, we ate reasonably well. Even if we had to have much the same thing night after night, there were far fewer stalls to choose from this year. It's the fifth time I've been to the festival, and the program was the best ever, with some great headline acts. They put on some excellent workshops as well, which cost us nothing. I went to one on face painting and another on African dance. I was rather disappointed that they moved the event this year, though. We had much less room than before, and the camping spots were a joke. Apart from that, we ate reasonably well, even if we had to have much the same thing night after night. There were far fewer stalls to choose from this year. Question four: You hear a man and a woman discussing a skiing holiday they have just been on. Well, that was a great week skiing, wasn't it? The snow couldn't have been much better. I suppose so, but I found it quite hard dealing with those conditions for the first couple of days. I'm not quite as good at skiing as you are, remember? You did fine. What about the hotel, though? I'm not sure I'd go back there again. It was a bit too big and impersonal for me, and the restaurant wasn't anything special. Oh, I don't know. The rooms were very comfortable, and the pool was fantastic. 
For me, the only bad thing was the airline schedule. Having to get up so early both ways. That was a real pain. You're right there. Well, perhaps we should take the train next time. Well, that was a great week skiing, wasn't it? The snow couldn't have been much better. I suppose so, but I found it quite hard dealing with those conditions for the first couple of days. I'm not quite as good at skiing as you are, remember? You did fine. What about the hotel, though? I'm not sure I'd go back there again. It was a bit too big and impersonal for me, and the restaurant wasn't anything special. Oh, I don't know. The rooms were very comfortable, and the pool was fantastic. For me, the only bad thing was the airline schedule. Having to get up so early both ways. That was a real pain. You're right there. Well, perhaps we should take the train next time. Question 5. You hear this conversation in a hotel. How may I help you, madam? I was on the phone to you from my room just now. Oh, yes.、Uh, there was something wrong with the phone. Is there a problem with the room? You're in 203, aren't you? Yes, I am. It's fine. I was actually ringing about room service. It's taken over 40 minutes for them to bring me a simple sandwich and a cup of coffee. Well, I was so appalled, I decided to come down here to have a word with you. How may I help you, madam? I was on the phone to you from my room just now. Oh, yes.、Uh, there was something wrong with the phone. Is there a problem with the room? You're in 203, aren't you? Yes, I am. It's fine. I was actually ringing about room service. It's taken over 40 minutes for them to bring me a simple sandwich and a cup of coffee. Well, I was so appalled, I decided to come down here to have a word with you. Question 6. You hear this radio report about a football match. Well, Grangewood Trent United has finished 1 0 after a match that was full of excitement. Grangewood took the lead with Bellamy's early goal, a wonderful return for him after his long absence with that broken leg. A crowd of supporters rushed across to Bellamy when the game was over, glad to see their hero back. The referee tried to stop them, but in the end, it was the whole Grangewood team who walked off the pitch with their delighted fans. Well, Grangewood Trent United has finished 1 0 after a match that was full of excitement. Grangewood took the lead with Bellamy's early goal, a wonderful return for him after his long absence with that broken leg. A crowd of supporters rushed across to Bellamy when the game was over, glad to see their hero back. The referee tried to stop them, but in the end, it was the whole Grangewood team who walked off the pitch with their delighted fans. Question 7. You hear part of an interview on the radio. So, Duncan, you left a well paid job in Glasgow to move to this beautiful island off the west coast of Scotland. Was it to escape the pressures of city life? Not really. I grew up in the countryside, and I know only too well how quiet it can be. I go back to Glasgow regularly, in fact, to enjoy the fast pace again. The point is, I was trying to write a novel while I was working, you know, weekends, evenings. And I realised I couldn't do both. So I quit and came here to cut costs. At the time, I didn't even have a publisher's contract, so it was a risky move. So, Duncan, you left a well paid job in Glasgow to move to this beautiful island off the west coast of Scotland. Was it to escape the pressures of city life? Not really. I grew up in the countryside, and I know only too well how quiet it can be. I go back to Glasgow regularly, in fact, to enjoy the fast pace again. The point is, I was trying to write a novel while I was working, you know, weekends, evenings, 
and I realised I couldn't do both. So I quit and came here to cut costs. At the time, I didn't even have a publisher's contract, so it was a risky move. Question 8. You hear a woman talking about an evening course. I've started this astronomy course, two hours a week on a Monday evening. Every week the lecturer shows a short film. We've seen one on the Hubble Space Telescope and another about the Sun. It's useful, although I can't help thinking we could watch those over the internet at home. We have to work out lots of calculations in class, and I must say that it's terrific. I thought it would be really hard work, but the time goes by really fast, and there's always a break. Not that the coffee is anything special. I can't wait to get back to my sums. I've started this astronomy course, two hours a week on a Monday evening. Every week the lecturer shows a short film. We've seen one on the Hubble Space Telescope and another about the Sun. It's useful, although I can't help thinking we could watch those over the internet at home. We have to work out lots of calculations in class, and I must say that it's terrific. I thought it would be really hard work, but the time goes by really fast, and there's always a break. Not that the coffee is anything special. I can't wait to get back to my sums. <laughs>